Welcome to the Phase World Podcast. Engaging conversations that cross the boundaries between business, art, and the digital world. Hi guys, it's Faye from Phase World. I am the host of a podcast dedicated to sung and unsung heroes, women, men, and children who carry these amazing stories and voices you may have never heard of. So please connect with me via social media. It's the same handle that is Phase World, F E I S W O R L D. I feel incredibly privileged and, and really lucky to be working with a small team of very talented people. And today I would like to give them a shout out. They are Adam Leffert, who is my associate producer and an incredible .NET developer. Sarah Weinkoop, social media strategist who has given me so many ideas in the past and recently joined Face World. Max Barry, a content and marketing guru who can only think of things I never could. So let's get into it. Today on Face World, you will meet David Delmar, founder and executive director at Resilient Coders. Resilient Coders is an organization dedicated to teaching young people who are from traditionally underserved communities how to code. They do this as a way of aligning them with a lucrative and meaningful career path. Their higher performers participate in Resilient Lab, a web design and development shop with real clients. David and his team offer many ways, time slots, long and short term engagements for you to get involved. Just to note, you don't have to be a developer to provide value. So go ahead and listen to this podcast and you'll understand a lot more than Resilient Coders does, but also why and how they do it. They say, I have a problem to solve. If I have, this, if I have, that, if I have the capacity to solve it, I'm going to solve it. And that's it. That's as far as it goes. So Resilient Coders started up as an effort to present sort of a third rail. It's not necessarily a school or street. Too many young people see the world as either school or street. And there's a third option here. There's, there's a real genuine meritocracy. And I know that there are folks out there who laugh at the notion that technology can be a meritocracy. And I would agree that it's not accessible to everybody. So that's what we need to do. Um, you have to come up with a question. Sitting there coming up with an answer to a pre-existing question is easy. Mm -hmm. You have to come up with a question. So, all right, so what am I going to build today? I don't know. You tell me. I'm here for the stuff that you can't Google. David shares his origin stories from working at PayPal in Boston, leading a team of designers and coders, to now Resilient Coders, which is creating something that may or may not work. He talks about the importance of getting very comfortable with failures. I asked David about what he was like as a child. He shared a story of how the purpose of his life was reframed for him at age five. That was probably one of my favorite moments on Phase World. And also the amazing story of his grandfather who was a bullfighter, a lawyer, and an actor. And please let us know how you enjoy this episode and perhaps what you have fiercely pursued in the past or are still pursuing. Without further ado, please welcome David Delmar from Resilient Coders. So I'm here with David uh, Delmar from Resilient Coders, and we're here at 21 Dry Dock Avenue, and this is the Mass Challenge space. It's unbelievable. I'm so glad we decided to record the interview here. But welcome uh, to Face World Podcast. Thank you so much for having me. It's really exciting. <laughs> what you're doing is phenomenal, and when I was getting coffee, I didn't want to give this part away, which is... I used to be a programmer. I studied computer science at oh, Northeastern. Cool. That's awesome. Uh, you were affiliated with Northeastern too, for some reason. What, why is that? I, I think I saw you. Uh, so we have um, the guy who runs Resilient Lab, which is our dev shop, mm -hmm. um, is, an, is a Northeastern student. Wow. Oh, I, I remember. Yeah, yeah. Under the, the list of people. Yep. And if you don't mind, I would like you to kind of share a story with my audience about what you do, who you are, and what Resilient Coders is all about. Sure. Um, so I, before um, launching Resilient Coders, I was at uh, PayPal here in Boston. 
uh, and I loved it. It was a great job. It was a lot of fun. I had a fantastic team. Um, and I was once sent to, uh, to a tech conference, which was fantastic. It was, a, it was a big festival. It was a lot of fun. I went down there, and I had this sort of unusual experience of watching all these great like the, the best and the brightest minds, right? And startups get up and pitch. Mm -hmm. uh, but they were pitching solutions, really elegant solutions to non-problems. Problem, <laughs> problems that are not problems. You know, here's another, here's another app that you can use to stalk someone. A uh, solution in search of a problem. Yeah, like exactly. Like, like, they, these are sort of programmers who would build something and then be like, all right, like, let's see if we can find a problem to, to solve that we can that we can sort of shove this into. Yeah. Um, and I was a little bit disillusioned. I have this, this notion of technology as having this role in society, uh, starting with the creation of fire, right? The invention of the wheel, um, that it just improves the quality of life for everyone. That's my vision of technology going back uh, thousands of years. Uh, and I was a little bit disillusioned with my own generation's contributions to technology and what that means. Um, I'm at this festival, this, this tech conference, listening to these folks, and then I start doing this little uh, experiment with myself, which is that I started counting uh, people of color um, that I happened to see at this, at this festival. Um, and I grew up, so I grew up in a Spanish-speaking household, and I'm, I'm listening for folks speaking Spanish. Um, and I counted about 14 people okay. among thousands of folks who were at this festival. Um, they were visibly, notably absent. Um, and I started digging into it. And I figured, see, that, that's an actual problem. Here are these the best and the brightest talking, trying to find problems to solve, and they don't see this problem that is staring us in the face. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I started digging into the problem, and um, at the same time, I was, I was volunteering with um, a couple of other organizations, uh, and through those organizations, I started meeting um, young people, um, some of whom were uh, incarcerated uh, or court involved in some capacity. Uh, and I started realizing about some of these kids, they were really smart. And I don't mean like patronizing, oh, you know, they're very smart. I mean like, no, really, they're really smart. Like we would have identified them as a smart kid in our school. Mm -hmm. uh, and what's happening is that they're using, they're using those things, they're using their resourcefulness, uh, their ingenuity, um, their creativity to solve the problems that are most immediately at hand. And so if you, if you, have, to grow, if you have to cross gang turf to get to school, if, you, uh, if your friend has been killed, if your sibling is hungry, if your mother cannot hold down a job, mm. you are not going to care about the quadratic equation <laughs> in school that day. Yeah. You can either spend that following weekend writing a report on the Warsaw Pact, or you can move a baggie from here to there and help solve that problem. Or you can participate in a gang and, and, and feel that sort of sense of fraternity, feel like you're doing something. And that's, what's in, that's what ends up happening. And so what I discovered, which to me was a total game changer, is that these young people, they don't offend despite their intellect. They offend because of their intellect. It happens so often that we say, but they are so smart. But they are so smart and they made this mistake. That's the thing is that they don't see it as a mistake at the time mm -hmm. too often. They say, I have a problem to solve. If I, have this, if, I have, if I have the capacity to solve it, I'm going to solve it, and that's it. That's mm -hmm. as far as it goes. So Resilient Code was started up as an effort to present sort of a third rail. Right? It's not necessarily a school or street. Too many young people see the world as either school or street. And there's a third option here. There's, there's a real genuine meritocracy. And I know that there are folks out there who laugh at the notion that technology can be a meritocracy, and I would agree that it's not accessible to everybody. So that's what we aim to do. Take this trade, because it is a trade, we treat it as such, and turn it into the meritocracy that it should be. When I first encountered your company, Resilient Coders, I went to the website, and I started looking at the examples that you showcase on the student work, and I realized that I had the, I had the preconception of somehow I had the feeling is like, no way. I mean, these kids did this? Uh, coming from a technology background, I know my training and all the luxury I had in my life for me to be who I am today. And I look at these kids, some of them are so young. I mean, I don't know who is, I mean, some of them look high school, I mean, college age, I, I realize, but I almost feel like I saw possibly people younger, some kids younger than college age. Am I, am I right? What is the age range? 
So we have two programs. Uh, we have a program that is a high school program uh, for young people who are uh, typically between the ages of 15 and 18. I see. Um, and then we have another program for, um, for older folks. Actually, that's what's taking place um, here. They just, just wrapped up um, a minute ago. It's our boot camp, and that's for uh, your older folks. So they're 18 to 24. Uh, so what is the qualification for someone listening to this podcast and thinking, wow, I'm a you know I'm also an underprivileged person or from a family or I know someone. How do they qualify to be part of your program? How do they apply? You know that's something we keep going back and forth on. And at the moment, there's no formal application. I just I just want to meet them. Um, really, the the one criteria that we try to uh, um, I guess enforce is too strong a word. The the one criteria that we look for is grit. Mm -hmm. What is it. the grit? Grit. Grit, okay. Grit. Mm -hmm. Is this someone who's going to sit through the extremely unglamorous task of debugging mm -hmm. to find that stupid semicolon? How do you find out if that person has the resilience? Well, that's, that's hard to do. So we don't, really, we don't really filter much out at the very beginning. What we do is that we get in front of the kids and we say, this is, this is, the, this is the deal here. This is going to be uncomfortable. Um, you are going to be overwhelmed. Um, this is going to be hard and I am not going to guide you through it. I don't have time to drag you through a curriculum. That's not what this is about. This is about making tools available to you, making our network of mentors available to you. Um, and you know what? After that, they self-select. Um, we, we have a pretty high drop-off rate um, for young people after their, after their like, first week or so with us. Um, and that's to be expected. Um, not, this sort of style of learning is not for everybody. But is it also fair to assume that once they gain the exposure to such a program, now they know that it exists, people like you exist, mm -hmm. um, and then there's a chance for them to come back? And I see that a lot coming from a martial art background. You know, it's hard work. Like, yeah. pe kids hate that, you know? They've done enough in school, but I see so many of them coming back, choosing. When they come back for the second time, many of them stay for years. Personally, I stay for life. Uh, so, so do you think that's... That's fair to assume. Do you see some of the kids return after saying, forget this? By the way, you can swear on my, on my podcast too, I forgot to mention that. Right on. Yeah, yeah, screw you. this. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, you know, it's a question of timing. Um, if, you, if you reach a kid when he is at an age where he's not in a place where he is willing to sort of put his, put his heart and soul into it, I respect that. Mm -hmm. I've, I've been there. Um, and I would love for them to sort of come back if and when they're at that point. And you know what? They don't need to come back to us. Mm -hmm. They can decide that they want to explore it again and do it on their own if they want to. Um, there are plenty of uh, free online resources that, uh, that folks can explore now if they want to get back into coding. Mm -hmm. um, and that's sort of what I've said to people who either aren't right for this program right now or they would love to do it but they don't have time because whatever, X, Y, Z, they're, they're, mm -hmm. they're athletes, they can't come after school, um, whatever. Mm -hmm. What are some of the most common sort of resistance that you've seen or, or legitimate you know challenges that people are experiencing as a result of not returning or continuing the program and I guess on the flip side of that what are some of the courage and surprises you've seen to say wow dude I didn't realize or girl girlfriend I didn't think you could stick around for this but you did yeah um, I so I'm gonna I'm gonna make some assumptions around why people split um, because I, I don't do exit interviews yeah. Um, <laughs> And uh, it, it doesn't surprise me at all when people split because it's, it's a very, it's, it's a style of learning that is anathema to the way in which we are raised in this country. Um, <clears throat> right now we are used to, someone gives you a problem and then you sit there and you figure it out and you hand it in and it's graded. Um, we are explicitly not that. Um, you have to come up with a question. Sitting there coming up with an answer to a pre-existing question is easy. Mm -hmm. You have to come up with a question. So, all right, so what am I going to build today? I don't know, you tell me. I'm here for the stuff that you can't Google. But if you want to build um, a website, I have, I have a student here who's building, his mother just opened a restaurant, so he's building a website for his mother's restaurant. Um, and if he has a question about, oh, how do I pull in uh, an API from Yelp or whatever, that I can help you with. Yeah, let's figure that out. Mm -hmm. But if the question is, so what should I do today? I can't, I can't help you. Mm -hmm. I can make suggestions. I can point you the direction of tons of things that I think are cool. What are some of the questions that you heard kids kind of brainstorming and say, you know what, David, I figured it out. Today my problem is going to be this. And I know you have sort of a 
study hall or like kind of a collaboration approach where you you're there for them but you're not you know pointing at them and say do this do that what are some of the interesting problems that you've heard so far possibly today uh, I actually so I heard one of my favorite ideas um, I was I was sworn to secrecy um, before <laughs> before he bailed on this project um, so I feel like I, I feel like I could speak to it um, but we had one student that had the uh, brilliant idea of uh, doing something you're familiar with you familiar with Drizzly um, mm. sounds familiar so, so Drizzly is a local startup that delivers alcohol so okay. you, you can call up and say I want you know okay. I want to get a whatever six pack yeah. to deliver um, I had a young man propose bringing that model uh, to medical marijuana, <laughs> and you know what? I when he brought that up, I laughed. His peers laughed, and he did not, because to him it's a question of safety. Yeah. He says my neighborhood could be so much more more my my neighborhood could be much safer mm. if we could just if drug trafficking were just not a thing. Yeah. Right. If I could, if people that I know could just sort of safely get access to pot, and we're talking just about pot here, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. then they don't have to deal with the sort of folks involved in the drug trade mm -hmm. uh, here in Boston. Uh, so for him, it was a question of safety, which I thought was a really interesting, a really interesting perspective. Yeah, and then we're talking about a young man or woman in this case trying to make a neighborhood better and safer. Exactly. And that's intriguing to me because of that question I've never thought before. One, I've, you know, this sounds embarrassing here in this country, I've actually not tried pot, and it's part of me, so I'm almost interested. Um, now I'm older and I'm very responsible. But on the flip side, that question never occurred to me because, you know, I live in Newton, Chestnut Hill, and I'm very comfortable. You know, I never thought about safety as an issue to me yeah. where I live. Um, and when I went to school, you know, Northeastern for a period of time was not very safe. And that whole uh, area, downtown crossing where I work now, it's not very safe. And what I do is I, I can just run away and escape from it after work. But I feel like you are interacting with people every day um, based on what I've read. You know, the gentleman, uh, I know his name is spelled like Micah, but it's, it's actually said to Macau? Mackay. Mackay. Yeah. yeah. Huh? Why is it different, by the way? Why is the pronunciation different? I don't know. Oh, okay. So the first thing I saw that video, which I'm going to include on my um, blog post and just kind of cool. embed it. And first thing he said is, you know, when I was young, I believe he was 15 or even younger, his family went homeless. Yeah. And I, you know, the resentment that, that he had for his family. And, and there's something he said, it was, I can't even paraphrase, it was so powerful about, you know, basically, tough lessons in life will really shape you into who you are. And that's life what he is, shows. Life is, defined by, life is defined by your hurdles. Yes. That's what he said. I, I love that line. I love that. Yeah. And again, I said, well, how did he come up with such sayings? I only hear from people like Tony Robbins and like Seth yeah. Godin. <laughs> and, yeah. And it, it's, really, it's really quite interesting. The, the way I observe myself as I'm preparing for this interview I try to remember the first time I heard about resilient coders and and think about the emotions and the sensations that I felt. And I remember doing that at work and then again at home and sending the link to friends and family. I, I realized every time I saw the website, I smiled. And I, I don't remember when was the last time for me to see something and smile, especially if it's a website. You're like, okay, how do I get to the stuff? Like store locator, you know. Yeah get through this task. I just, I smile because I start thinking about someone like yourself and we're the same age and, and I, I finally took the leap to do something I want to do. But there you are, you've been running the company for a year and nine months. So I really want to hear about you as well, where you grew up and how long have you been thinking about this? And I feel like this even before the tech conference you, you went to. Tell, tell me about who, who you were as a, like a little boy. like. You know, growing up, maybe when you were 10, because people believe that the dreams you have when you're 10 years old are very important in, into how you, how you grow up, how you shape yourself. Yeah. Um, well, I've never been asked that before. It's a really good one. Um, <laughs> yeah, it, it has a lot to do with my, my family. Um, I grew up, um, my, my parents were fantastic people, are fantastic people. Um, they, uh, they immigrated here. My family's in Mexico. Um, and I grew up with them. I had they were fantastic parents. I went to uh, a wonderful school, um, and 
but social justice was always very important, particularly to my mother. Um, and she, <clears throat> we were we were visiting family in Mexico one Christmas, um, and I was probably being a little shit. <laughs> um, and she said, "You know what we're gonna do? We're, we're gonna bring, we're gonna bring cake to an orphanage because mm-hmm. that's a thing that still exists in, in Mexico in a way that doesn't exist here, like an actual huge like orphanage." Mm-hmm. Um, and I did. I was must have been, how much? I must have been five or six. Uh, and I remember bringing a cake that was small enough for me to hold, for me to carry. Uh, and I walked into a room the size of the cafeteria mm-hmm. that I. Yeah, my school, and it was filled with kids banging their forks on the table, saying "cake, cake, oh cake." So cool. They were so pumped about the cake, and I remember thinking, like looking down at my hands and realizing that I didn't have anywhere nearly enough cake for all the kids, and that was my immediate lesson in so many things. It was my immediate lesson in uh, the fact that some people have and some people have not. Um, the fact that, geez, like 80, 90 percent of those kids are not going to have any of the cake, even if we just give them the tiniest of slices. And it made me realize that for me to complain about getting the wrong toy for Christmas <laughs> was ridiculous. It was ridiculous and absurd, and it sort of reframed for me at even a young age uh, the fact that there's there's nothing there's nothing that goes into the success that I have had in my life. Nothing mm-hmm. outside of luck. Mm-hmm. I was lucky enough. Born into a family. Lucky enough to be born into a certain family. Warren Buffett calls it. The, uh, what does he call it? The ovarian lottery. <laughs> I love this. I won, I won the ovarian lottery. I was just oh. born to the right people at the right time, in the right place. Yeah. Um, and um, so growing up, uh, I, was, I was a kid who was deeply skeptical of school, deeply ske- skeptical of uh, any sort of figure of authority. I didn't like to be told what to do and how to do it and why. Um, and uh, but the thing around me is that I, the thing is that I would look around me and I would I would see people going through school, and then they went from school to employment. And I, all my my friends' parents mm-hmm. they could they could support them. Um, everybody grew up okay. They went through school. They left, and so they got to where they needed to go. And so it became clear to me that whether I like it or not, school was still a vehicle through which I could get from point A to point B. I thought it was stupid, I thought it was broken, mm-hmm. I thought it was ridiculous, but I understood the value of, get, of smiling and nodding and getting the piece of paper at the end of the story. Mm-hmm. Um, and what I started realizing is that not everybody has the experience of growing up in a community where everybody is employed. There are so many people here in Boston that look around them at, the, at their community and they see traditional education failing to deliver over and over and over again. And so these kids think, I can sit here for 12 years, submit to an authority structure that I don't believe in, and at the end of it, maybe, maybe I'll get to work security and unload Pepsi trucks, and that's it. Now when that becomes the narrative of your life, why the hell, why the hell would you invest your time and your energy in school? Now, you might go, you might show up every day, mm-hmm. But you're not going to sit there and then really invest your energy in something that you see as completely futile. Mm-hmm. And so when I started meeting these kids, one of the things that I realized off the bat is that we are so incredibly similar in some ways and so incredibly dissimilar in others. We're incredibly dissimilar in the fact that I grew up not ever having to fear for my life. Mm-hmm. I grew up never having to worry about the police. Mm-hmm. Um, or whether or not I was in danger or whether or not I was being profiled. Um, and, um, but then again, I also had that skepticism of school and I used to disagree and argue with my teachers. Um, and, and so I get it. I, I agree with the, with the education gap you were describing. Yeah. And because of, because of knowing you and knowing what you do, I just found myself spending so much time thinking about this, thinking about the people around me, many of them much younger, you know, family members who are 18, 19, 20 years old. And, you know, I start asking these questions because these kids' parents are doctors and lawyers. They know so many more words than I do. I I originally grew up in Beijing and I literally turned to this 18-year-old for like these fabulous vocabularies. 
and I realize he's always going to be ahead um, compared to you know underprivileged kids and then from there not just how you were raised but also from there your parents have these relationships your parents friends can introduce you can kind of springboard you and then so right. there's one thing on your website that really shocked me yesterday I was like oh that's that basically encapsulate like what I'm trying to say which you're I don't have the website open, but you're really talking about hacking the gap, how to close the gap. How do you say it again? Hacking the opportunity gap. Right. So they used to call it, they used to call it the achievement gap. Mm-hmm. Um, but the thing is about the achievement gap is that it's 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 a little bit um, it's a little bit myopic, mm-hmm. right? It's there's an achievement gap, yes, but there's an achievement gap because there's an opportunity gap. Um, and what people don't realize is that there are there are real factors that go into that stuff. Uh, it's not something that we can just get up and, and sort of solve, Mm -hmm. but we can sort of chip away at it. Um, I use the word hack uh, quite a bit. I use it with my students. Um, I call them our hackers. Uh, And the reason I do that is not because they're going to sort of bust a firewall and steal your money. Um, (laughs) Or they could. (laughs) Or they could, yeah. Um, uh, To me, the word hacker is is someone who is able to find an unconventional solution to an obstacle. Um, So in the digital realm, that means that you're able to sort of get get, get around that firewall, right? But it could also just mean finding some other backdoor solution that somebody else hasn't thought of. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's, that's what we try to, uh, that's what we really, that's sort of the culture that we try to foment. Uh, actually, this first week of boot camp, we didn't do anything technical, and we spent that entire week just thinking about, rethinking how we think about things. Um, and it's, it's just, it's, it's all about, like, let's see if we can find another solution to this. Um, that's kind of what, what the pedagogy is built on. Mm-hmm. I can help recognizing the fact that the people in the room with me by looking at you, you know, not only similarly in an age where we're slightly the older millennials, but we're apparently still millennials, um, you know, come from a really good family, you went to BU. Uh, I know you're awarded as a, you know, very innovative alumni, contributed to society. Thank you. And hearing you talk, that passion has never died down. <laughs> you know, I feel like... If, not only just picked up, and you were a design lead in PayPal. Now, I want to pause on the things that you did actually before you started the company, which clearly set the sort of the groundwork, and there's a lot that goes into uh, establishing this. But how have, of course, you thought about this, but how do you manage your own expectation and, and people around you, your family or friends, where it is such a traditional path of going through companies like PayPal? Arnold, I don't know, Microsoft, and then you started this thing that may or may not work. And, and not only that, it's almost like pouring your soul out. And Seth Godin always says, you know, here, I made this. It might not be for you. It might not work. There's no guarantee. How, how, how do you deal with all that? Uh, by being extremely comfortable with failure. Um, I have failed so many times at so many things. I was supposed to be so many other things. Um, and uh, I think it's those failures that um, that make you who you are um, in, in a very real sense. One of the most interesting people I have ever known um, was my grandfather, who started off his career uh, as a bullfighter, and then he was uh, then he was a lawyer, uh, and then he was an actor. Is yeah. he still with us? No, he's not with us anymore. But um, but he was all these different things, and he just mm-hmm. he just sort of fearlessly tried the thing he was passionate about. Um, and I know that's sort of a very Disney thing to say, that you know, follow your passion. Uh, you just have to be really comfortable with failure. Um, I've, you know, I've, I failed at a ton of stuff. I've definitely launched, I've, I've launched a startup in the past that tanked. Um, uh, yeah, I was supposed to be an artist. Uh, I was supposed to do comic books. Uh-huh. Uh, my plan was to go to school. Uh, I went to art school, the BU College of Fine Arts, uh, and I was gonna be a comic book uh, illustrator. That was my passion. Um, I wanted to be that too, by the way. I, that's awesome. I'm a digital producer, so maybe, I don't know, maybe that's we'll really work cool. something out. That's awesome. <laughs> um, and there are, just, there are a bunch of things that I, that I tried that I wanted to be. Uh, for, like for a minute, I was an art critic. Uh, mm-hmm. for like, yeah, for real. Uh, I wanted to, for a while, I wanted to be a writer, and I wrote two horrible novels mm-hmm. that no one shall ever see again. They're so bad. <laughs> um, <laughs> I played in a band. We did the whole touring thing. I was supposed to be a rock star. That didn't quite pan out. What instrument? <laughs> I played guitar. Nice. nice. Um, 
and uh, the the we we're also really open about this this notion of failure and this culture of failure and accepting failure with our students because it has a resonance on a personal level. Um, I have I have failed at many things professionally, um, but I, I certainly can't. Um, my, my students have seen a, a different level of failure or disappointment, um, mm -hmm. one that I can't really touch, um, but it's it's one that we still try to kind of leverage and tap into, uh, if only to say, look, failure is just a part of what makes you as a person. Mm -hmm. Okay, now I really have to go to one one of your workshops, and because I'm going to ask and I, I just love how easily accessible you, you make your classes, workshops to be. And I especially like the, the email you wrote, which I did not tweet, <laughs> compare. You know, you're like, please, please don't go crazy on social media. It, it's really good. It's about, you know, sharing an idea and spreading it out. And the way I, I find out about you is through, I believe, Todd Buffum, who is a digital producer at Arnold. And he sent an email out to digital producer, UX designers, and developers, and it just gives my audience an idea of some of the things you're teaching. And then I almost felt like I'm unqualified, you know, like to to teach your students. I really felt that way, but I really want to. Now I don't feel that way anymore. I feel like I could learn something, uh, pick something up, and really, you know, I was thinking I I'll be too old to be a student, but um, really love to explore some uh, opportunities there. One of the things I, I want this podcast to serve you as well, um, for people to listen to, and I just, I think all of us just missing this kind of conversation. One thing, it's very obvious if you invite your students in, provide a physical space for them to learn, not only from you, but also from each other. And the fact that, that they can be in the same room together is, is phenomenal because they share, many of them potentially share the same struggles. Mm -hmm. um, and. So I, I noticed on your website that you're hiring a program director, and do you want to mention uh, a few things about that, or has that role been filled? Um, uh, so the role hasn't been actually the, the role has actually kind of morphed a little bit. Um, the, the role turned into development manager, yeah, um, because I, I just think that I'm more of a program person than I am a, a fundraising person, mm -hmm. uh, and so we're looking for a development manager. Um, the position has not been filled. We do have a we do have a few. Uh, candidates that we're uh, mm -hmm. pursuing, um, mm -hmm. but it hasn't been filled, and if people want to be um, join the Resilient team, they should definitely email me, david at resilientcoders.org. Great. And to mention that, that you're making it super accessible for people to get involved on so many levels, uh, including people who are not technical, who are not developers or designers per se. Um, so. This is this has, has been absolutely wonderful, and I feel so uplifted, and I feel like a different person leaving this building for some reason, and you know coming all the way here. It's kind of you. Oh, thank you. Are there anything that like the tip of your tongue? Like I haven't asked, but there's something you really want to share um, with me or with my audience. Yeah, so there are, uh, there are a few things that we're aggressively pursuing at the moment, one of which is mentors. Um, so we have instructors uh, who, who are coming and they're giving um, like 90 minute workshops. Uh, mm -hmm. Some people bring a PowerPoint presentation. It's sort of, it's very um, structured like that. Um, but even, even more powerful than that is men like one-on-one -on -one mentorship. So we also have people come in and function sort of as a TA mm -hmm. um, to help our students make sure that they know uh, that they're going in the right path. Um, now we're also we're just rolling out a, a program that's new to us, which is one-on-one uh, -on -one mentorship. So think like Big Brother Big Sister, mm -hmm. but with a technical bent. Mm -hmm. um, so if, if that if you're listening to this and it sounds like you could be um, a mentor uh, to one of these young people, um, that would be fantastic. Please reach out and. Um, and we're also, um, we have Resilient Lab. Resilient Lab is our web development shop. Uh, and it employs our higher performing students. Um, so if you also, if you want some work done, if you need a, a dev shop, I hope you will think of us. I'm gonna make the plug once. Uh, check out resilientcoders.org resilient slash lab. Uh, there's some information about how that works um, and how we're able to uh, maintain a standard of professional quality even though it's being worked on by uh, young people who are new to the field. Mm -hmm. um, we even disclose sort of payment structure. We're very transparent about how that all works. Mm -hmm. And if we just nerd out for a second, because I'm a I'm a producer myself, and this is kind of my line of work. Is yeah. 
uh, I saw that I know that your current website is custom build. So in addition to that, um, do you guys do any, you know, what are some of the computer languages or that you feel like your students kind of excel at and, and yeah. the CMSs? You know what's funny about the, the site being custom built? Um, that's that's just me. I just like I just like doing it. Uh -huh. um, so I, I understand. I get this a lot from my developer friends. I know that I could save a lot of time using Bootstrap and whatever, mm -hmm. um, but I wanted to just do it. Um, there's a little bit of a, a cheesy like parallax thing going on that on the on that homepage yeah. uh, and desktop, um, and so I've actually thrown it out to my students um, that uh, there's sort of like an ongoing challenge, uh, which is figure out how that works mm -hmm. uh, and replicate it. Don't just don't just replicate it by like ripping the code, but be able to describe why it works. Um, and no one's answered it yet, but we'll mm. we'll get there. Interesting. Um, they're also I think they're not really. I haven't. I have to remind them of it because um, that was like months ago that I made that announcement. Mm. Um, in terms of languages, we're very much tied to what's uh, what the needs of the market are. Mm -hmm. um, so we do. Everyone does a core with HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, uh, and then from there, um, people kind of go down the paths that they that they want to explore. We try to make this as self guided as possible. Um, so we've had we've had uh, one student explore design. Um, we've had a handful of students explore kind of back-end stuff. Um, most of them kind of stay within the JavaScript realm, which is fine with me, because JavaScript is like obviously like a critical thing yeah. to be awesome at. Yeah. Uh, and it's, nothing, it's something that you, you can't really, you don't really master, mm -hmm. or at least not within the first few years of, of your mm -hmm. professional career. Mm -hmm. um, we do do a little bit of, a little bit of Ruby, um, some Rails, um, but that's just, that's just a taste. Mm -hmm. uh, my objective with our students is not mastery, but rather self-sufficiency. Uh, so what that means is I, I don't have any expectation that, that uh, our students will leave the program and that they're just going to sort of crush it mm -hmm. uh, in Rails. Mm -hmm. uh, my expectation is that um, as they're leaving the program, they have that spark where they can go home uh, and keep working and, and just, keep, uh, just keep pushing themselves through the process of getting better at this particular trade, mm -hmm. um, just like those of us who are self-taught all did. Are you open to letting employers sort of extract some of the students and say, especially the high performers, and for them to land a, a job somewhere else? Yes. Okay. Uh, so we are also launching uh, an internship program. Cool. Um, we are launching an internship program. This is new to us, um, but we're really excited about it. Um, and so folks who, um, folks who are considering employing some of our students should reach out to me. Again, that's david at resilientcoders.org. Um, there are a lot of folks in the city who are really excited about this opportunity. Um, the mayor himself is really excited about this opportunity uh, and actually is, is uh, um, well, he's, he just wants to be as involved as possible uh, in making that happen however he can. That's great. And it was just one suggestion, if there's a possibility for you to drag a few students, uh, maybe just to go to local agencies, which for you is only a five minute ride, to mm -hmm. Arnold, to Mullen, and to Digitas, if they could even just do like a lunch and learn, you know, something super casual with some food involved. Yeah. I think that we will be great. Personally, I'm such a traveler. You just tell me an address, I'm in Uber, I'm there. I notice how difficult, I think it's a culture thing, that for people to go to another place, even if it's really close, there's always a lot of last minute excuses. So yeah. if you could drop yourself at certain locations where there are already people there, there are a lot of connections and money, I think that would be an interesting approach as well. That's a great idea. Yeah. I'm into it. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time. You're so easy to talk to. And Thank you, Faye, likewise. To listen to more episodes of the Face World podcast, please subscribe on iTunes or visit faceworld.com. That is F E I S W O R L D, where you can find show notes, links, other tools, and resources. You can also follow me on Twitter at Face World. Until next time, thanks for listening.